Okay, it is 2.55 right now. Since it's a short session, we'll go ahead and get started. So we make sure that our presenter, Nicole White of Simon Fraser University, has sufficient time to talk. Um, please make sure that you are muted and you have your sound and um, video off during the session. Um, if you do have questions during the question and answer period and you feel like unmuting yourself, absolutely please do. Um, otherwise, please just uh, enter any questions into the Q&A section on the side and um, I will be happy to read those during Q&A. All right, so thank you. Nicole, please. Uh, thanks, Sally. You can hear me okay? Okay. Yes, sure. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to share a bit about the findings related to embargoes from our, a survey I conducted uh, early this year on Canadian University ETD programs. So as Sally mentioned, I am Nicole White. I'm head of SFU Libraries Research Commons, and that's a unit that supports faculty, graduate students, and postdoctoral fellows across the research writing and publication life cycle. The Research Commons is also home to our institution's ETD program. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with SFU, it, it's located about 30 minutes east of Vancouver, British Columbia, and we have branch campuses in both Vancouver and in Surrey. SFU is on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the tsleil Squamish, Musqueam, Quiquitlam, Caitse, and Semiamu nations, and I'm truly uh, grateful to live and work on these lands. Um, a little bit about SFU, we, we do have uh, offer undergraduate degrees as well as master's and doctoral programs across eight faculties. We have approximately 2,500 master's students and about 1,300 doctoral students. Uh, just to give you some background on the survey that I conducted, the primary purpose of the survey was service improvement at our own institution. Uh, we wanted to look at our own ETD program to make improvements and then of course share the results more broadly with the ETD community. Uh, we looked, or this survey I looked uh, specifically, the scope was Canadian University ETD programs uh, using SurveyMonkey I used um, through January through March of 2021, I ran the survey. The invitation was sent to 52 institutions and I received 36 responses. Uh, and the institutional participants were selected from among those appearing in the University's Canada online database. There were 75 universities I identified as having at least one master's or doctoral program. And then from that, I was able to um, be in touch with 52 institutions. So though my focus today is on, on embargoes, the survey also touched upon other areas of ED, ETD programs like policy, staffing, workflows, emerging formats, as well as services like consultation and instruction. Uh, with every survey comes with some limitations, so I just thought I'd um, make a quick note about those. The study was really in, uh, intentionally broad. It covered a wide range of program and policy and service areas and didn't seek to interrogate uh, particular areas in great depth or be exhaust exhaustive in one area. Uh, uh, it was really uh, done to look at areas um, that were of interest in our own ETD context. So it, it did mean that the, it, their survey was somewhat unbalanced in that way. Uh, I didn't want, to, there were no required fields in the survey. So I didn't want to place undue barriers on those responding to questions. Um, what I found was that jurisdiction and responsibility for the ETD pr programs, and you likely will know in your own role in your own institution that responsibility and jurisdiction over many aspects of ETD, ETD programs are spread uh, across, often across library units or departments, across faculties or schools. So as a result, the survey participants were in some cases understandably unfamiliar with the decision making or workflows or policies at their institution. So during the analysis stage, I sometimes found that information provided by the survey participants con uh, contradicted the information that was available on the institution's web pages. So um, where possible, I, I try to supplement that information from web pages. Last and associated with the first bullet uh, survey, the survey that I conducted was also um, extensive and it, it required a fairly long time commitment of participants. So unfortunately, the survey responses to all questions uh, sometimes was spotty. So with those limitations out of the way, 
uh, what, what were the findings? So very basically, um, I did ask survey participants to indicate whether there was an embargo policy and I found at Canadian institutions, these are widespread. So just over about 80% or 26 out of the 32 respondents indicated that they have a university policy specific to thesis embargoes. For those institutions that see 500 or more theses deposited annually at their institution, that increases to 89% and actually to 100% if you consider the university websites the authoritative source of the information. Uh, for anyone who's uh, joining us from Canada, 22 out of the 23 Canadian Association of Research Library member participants responded that they have an embargo policy at their in institution. And the one remaining institution that didn't have a university policy covering embargoes uh, all made available a form uh, within the School of Graduate Studies that was in place to request a thesis not be published in the library's institution or repository for a year. So not surprisingly, embargo policies were less common at institutions where submission numbers were lower. For institutions that accept between 1 and 500 annual submissions, 43% or 6 of the 14 participants indicated that no embargo policy existed. In light of the adoption of open access policies and education and advocacy for open scholarship since the early 2000s, one might think that the theses um, deposit requirements and the associated embargo policies might live within an institution's open access policy. And I found this was very uncommon, actually. In almost all cases, embargo policies are found within the graduate school policies or regulations. And I suspect this is likely due to the fact that institutional policies have been developed after ETD programs were established and already made the requirement for deposit explicit in its graduate general regulations or research policies. Um, just one final note on that friend is, in a small number of exceptions, the reference to thesis embargoes is found within the a university's research and publication policy for the university more broadly, rather than within the graduate general regulations. So in terms of policy language, it often mirrors the language, uh, having kind of been involved with open access policies at our own institution and, and seeing how open access policies have developed, it's been interesting to look at. And borrow policy seems to be uh, kind of a mini version. The language and structure that you'd find in a university's open access policy um, is kind of in mini. Some begin with a mission or vision statement relating to the obligations graduate students have to making their research open. They also recognize public funding or specifically in the Canadian context, the tri-agency requirements for open access. The tri-agencies in Canada being the three largest government funding bodies or funding agencies. So you can see uh, some examples I've left there on the slide. I do find it uh, curious that there are few references to OA policies um, typically in the graduate uh, regulations. Following the broader vision and mission statements, embargo policies uh, identify that not all research, of course, can be made open. Uh, there may be ethical or legal reasons to restrict access to a thesis necessary to protect the safety of individuals and groups that may be at risk as a result of openly available research. On this front, you can see policy language becomes frequently vague. Um, <laughs> and universities seem to, to find all sorts of different synonyms to, uh, to um, outline this so a good reason for delaying public access or compelling justifiable valid reasons or jeopardizing the students interests <clears throat> uh, ultimately what it comes down to most often is inter interpretation of what is a good or compelling reason is left to the discretion typically of the dean of graduates the dean of the graduate school or uh, in and that's often with the support of a supervisor or committee So I, I also looked at um, the nature uh, of the request for embargo. So patent pending or patent application was the rationale across Canadian institutions where embargoes were most frequently granted. Narr narrative responses to the survey indicated that um, two years was very, very typical for uh, patent pending or uh, uh, patent application. Uh, there does seem to be varying levels of oversight uh, for um, this uh, embargo rationale with some institutions requiring evidence of the patent application prior to approving the embargo request. 
Um, pending publication does remain among also um, unsurprisingly for many of you who are involved in this area. It came up in um, the session earlier this week. Um, it, pending publication uh, is still approved um, by 82% of institutions or 23 of 28 respondents that they would approve embargoes based on pending publication. So whether this is coming from the students themselves or from advice given by supervisors or colleagues, fears that an open thesis will jeopardize future publication persists. This is despite evidence that publishers will most often permit articles or chapters derived from theses to be deposited in an institutional repository and don't see uh, consider them to be published material. And uh, again, many of you will, will know well um, Ramirez and Macmillan and others uh, in do open access electronic theses and dissertations diminish publishing opportunities in the sciences. And more recently, um, Gilliam and Dehodas looked at this. Can openly accessible e-theses be published as monographs, a short survey of academic publishers? So a number of institutions did note attempts to reduce the number of embargoes based on pen pending publication, which I found interesting. Some took an educational approach, uh, making available information uh, or, re or requesting that students check journal publisher policies before requesting a delay in publication. Um, they advise that there is often a statement on a journal's website or in the author agreement describing publication terms. Uh, what you'll see in our own, um, our own um, uh, postponement request form, we have a note, planned publication in a scholarly venue normally does not constitute a valid reason for postponement. And we ask that um, students list, you can see further down on that page, publication pending in restrictive venue. We um, will allow it if, if there is a restrictive venue uh, and we ask that the students indicate for which journal or uh, where, which journal they're, they're um, going to be publishing with so that we can also follow up. Um, what we are finding most often is that um, the, the, the actual restrictions um, are different from the student's perspective on whether there's, there's restrictions on, on um, a thesis being available. Okay, so back to this. So pr uh, proprietary knowledge, 71% indicated they would um, allow an embargo based on proprietary knowledge. So this could be a contract between a research sponsor and the university or funding um, that is coming from a commercial a commercial company, which has delayed a, a requ or requested a delay in publication. Uh, the next up, uh, fear of persecution or concerns over author or study participant safety. 61% indicated that they would embargo, uh, approve an embargo on these grounds. And survey participants indicated that in the, narr in the narrative feedback uh, in the survey that it was these cases they looked at most closely and were most often the basis for an embargo extension. Um, I did find it interesting that no university policy that was provided by participants in the study uh, currently recognized protected Indigenous knowledge as a justification or rationale for an embargo. Although, so there was no information on, on websites or um, just nothing available, although 43% indicated that embargoes would be approved for this reason. So it seems to indicate that more information is, needs to be made available to students that this is an option. Um, either through in, in policy or in uh, on ETD pages where students uh, can get this kind of advice to highlight the option for Indigenous re researchers and also for non-Indigenous researchers working with Indigenous people, knowledge and data. Uh, finally, uh, the last uh, one, uh, 10 libraries indicated, or it was 36% of respondents indicated that no rationale for embargo was required of students. One noted that uh, students are granted an automatic one-year embargo if they wish and are not required to provide a rationale unless they want to extend the embargo period an additional year. And at that point, a full rationale would be required. Okay, something I'm looking into further is the impact that manuscript submissions as well as other forms of scholarship are having on embargo requests and specifically that those that, that involve collaborative teams. This may be within and across institutions 
um, that may have differing in embargo policies and is further complicated uh, when uh, a researcher may be working with community partners. Um, what we're seeing in the rationales at our own institution um, sort of reflect this uh, more complex partnership. So for example, um, to publish early would be detrimental to collaboration with others or share, this is a shared research project, members may be negatively impacted if the data is released too soon. And finally, the results of the research um, must be shared with partners first. So um, again, there's, there's little policy guidance on this and, and um, it seems to be becoming uh, more the norm as scholarship or scholarly outputs are changing. Nicole, um, yeah. don't mean to, uh, just want to let you know, uh, five minute warning, so. Thank you so much, Sally. Okay, uh, embargo length, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll speed up here. So embargo length, um, if taken together uh, between up to one year and one to two years, it, that covers about 70% of libraries that responded that they would allow a, no longer than a two year embargo. <clears throat> a few allowed between two and five years, I think it was 30%. Uh, five to 10 years came in at 10. And it was quite gratifying to see that um, no institution would allow a permanent embargo. <clears throat> Extensions, 72% will allow embargoes to be extended. And uh, again, all institutions said ultimately, uh, following embargo periods, a thesis must be made available online only, or online. Uh, campus only option, um, what I found, uh, 78 almost like 80 percent really said no campus only option is available for theses and 20 percent did and what i found interesting it was really the small institutions that had the um campus only option available so because institutions provided estimates and bans of both the number of submissions and the number of embargoes it wasn't possible to determine an accurate percentage of embargoes to the number of submissions but that said there was a study in canada that was done in 2012 that looked at embargoes and it was probably or it was estimated between 25 and 34 uh, percent i think it's substantially less now i would guess if looking at our own data it's, it's more in the range of 10 percent or less um, a significant number of libraries don't track this information which makes um, this difficult to know so you can see most, um, even there's um, two institutions, for example, that had over a thousand submissions per year and had fewer than 25 embargo requests, which is, is quite incredible. Okay, so some just some last, okay, last couple of points before I turn it over for questions. Metadata, it's a, a common 67% of libraries do make metadata available during the embargo period. Um, also, 68% have the ability to embargo supplemental files separately from the thesis, which is a re request that we get uh, on occasion at our own institution. And finally, uh, takedown practices. So 78% uh, of institutions will uh, allow a thesis to be removed from their repository. Um, the rationale provided by these uh, groups is typically, there's a couple of reasons why one would be the um, thesis escaped. It was a it was a mistake on the part of the institution, or the embargo ran out without the student's knowledge. Uh, the other uh, uh, digitization projects um, permissions were never received, and so takedown is automatic when students um, request. And finally, there were um, a number of situations where an author had requested to remove a thesis because their own career trajectory did not match. Um, their their thesis any longer and they didn't want future employers or current employers to have access to their thesis. So with that, I will stop with one minute left. I'm sorry, Sally. No, no worries. Excellent presentation. Does anyone have any questions for Nicole? Again, you can either put it in the Q&A or if you would like to unmute and ask, please do. One thing that I thought was really interesting. Oh, got something in the chat. Yeah, yeah Roxanne Treese says this is very interesting, helpful to know what other institutions are doing in regard to embargoes. Definitely, definitely. Um, one thing I thought of that um, I'm that I might bring up the next time we're looking at the embargo uh, rules again. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. 
is the idea of making the dissertation or thesis available, uh, but embargoing just the data set or the supplemental information. Um, we don't have a whole, whole, whole lot of those. Um, I'd, I'd actually think it would be interesting if we did, but that's an, that's an option that I'm going to introduce to see if anyone else would want to. Oh, looks like we have a question. I, I see Timothy's question. Timothy, oh. um, <clears throat> only anecdotally, um, I sus only I only have anecdotal evidence on on the on the on faculty influence front, and I think it's an I think it's a. Um, faculty have a particular halo that um, w when in looking at our own uh, embargo requests, I do see it commonly the case that um, graduate students of a particular supervisor will quite often have multiple embargo requests. So they are getting that advice from that supervisor to request an embargo. Um, I, I suspect that's the case at other institutions where education and um, support for faculty um, would be useful in trying to reduce the number of embargoes. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, uh, I can't talk, thank you. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, Nicole. Um, this is unfortunately the end of the session. We'd all love to hear more. Uh, please make sure that everybody comes to the uh, virtual happy hour at four o'clock. We're going to be giving away, four o'clock Eastern time. We're going to be giving away uh, some swag. So hopefully we'll see you there. And thank you again, Nicole. All right, thanks, Ellie. Have a great rest of the day. Bye for now.